All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to our third Access to Justice Forum. We've had now uh, uh, Access to Justice Forum, our first one, which was last fall, where we invited a delegation of folks from Mexico to come and to talk with us about rule of law development in Mexico and the drug law. And uh, let me just give you a little bit of a heads up on what's happened since that conference took place. You see that my friend Ruben Gutman here is wearing a green tie. This was a tie that was given to us in the inauguration of UPAPE, which is an institute for advocacy in Mexico. And my, some of my torch students know this because I was gone for a little while. We inaugurated the first institute of trial advocacy in Mexico, and they conducted their first ever training program training 45 judges and lawyers from across Mexico in uh, the new advocacy skills that Mexican lawyers are using as they move to an oral adversarial proceeding uh, as, as mandated by their constitution. So that was our first Access to Justice conference that we held in the fall. And then in the spring, we followed that up with an Access to Justice conference that focused on civil rights and the civil rights movement. We had a wonderful uh, full discussion about civil rights and the state of civil rights in the United States and the way that the courts were managing issues involving civil rights. And now we come back with a two-part, an Access to Justice Forum tonight. It's going to focus on the independence of the courts, the federal courts in particular, and whether or not we're asking the question whether they have become biased in favor of corporations and institutions and whether or not, in fact, folks have fair access to justice in our federal court system. And then tomorrow, we have the pleasure of seeing the movie Hot Coffee that's going to be shown, and we invite you all to come, and we're very excited about that, and the director of the movie, Susan Salendorf, is uh, here uh, and is going to participate in a panel discussion with us all about, about uh, Hot Coffee, the movie, and tort reform issues and state issues in particular in access to justice in our state courts. We understand from Susan that she's working on a second movie and uh, we'll also hear a little bit about that so come and, and she'll tell us about this follow-on project about our, our election systems and a follow-up on something that we're going to talk about today which obviously is the Citizens United case and whether corporations have free speech rights. So we're looking forward to hearing about that project too. So what are we going to do tonight? Well, we're going to talk about access to the federal courts, and we're really looking at pleading issues, issues involving also the courts kicking out of its system to arbitration uh, a number of cases that the courts consider, and then also, finally, class actions, and talking about are these rules that the court has set up, are they fair and are they balanced? And to introduce our panelists, let me turn it over to Reuben Gutman. Reuben Gutman is a wonderful supporter, you see, of the law school in a variety of ways. Let me encourage you all to realize that he is going to bat for you all students. Uh, he's been a terrific inspiration for us all in trying to find jobs for our students and trying to encourage alumni to employ our folks because we think we've got a great product in you all and we think that yeah, especially you'll be all great trial lawyers and Ruben's been inspiring us in that regard. He's also been part of, of the team that's gone down to Mexico. Uh, we're working on a project in China together and so Ruben and I are uh, trying to do this rule of law projects in a variety of settings and cultures. So Ruben, it's great to have you and please introduce our panelists. Thanks Paul. You know, uh, I was a law student here with Rick Hanthorne who uh, I fared far better in law school than I did. He was the editor of the Law Journal back in 19, 1985, if I recall, that we graduated 26 years ago. So it's a thrill Jesus, to be here with the class. <laughs> and, uh, Thanks, Doc. And uh, before I introduce Susan, I, I, anything I know about administrative law is because of Professor Arthur, and anything I know about uh, civil procedure and uh, pretrial litigation is because of Professor Cloud, who actually looks the same as he did 26 years ago, looks terrific. And um, Cheryl Laguerre, we're really, really pleased to have, who's the have president. You, have you had your prescription checked? No. no. <laughs> Everything I, I take is off like label. Uh, <laughs> Cheryl Laguerre is the president of the National Employment Lawyers Association chapter in Georgia, and it's a, a terrific uh, privilege to have her. My colleague, Chris Hall, is uh, 
sort of one of the great young aggressive trial lawyers uh, in, in Atlanta and he was a co-counsel uh, with us in a very large antitrust case against Sirius XM that just settled and I you know, I was honored to work with him and he actually developed a theory in the case. Uh, uh, Jeff Bramlett, uh, it's obviously an honor to have, who's the former president of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Georgia Bar Association and, and uh, he was the lead counsel in one of the largest uh, race discrimination class actions against a soft drink company whose name I will not specifically mention in this forum. And Susan Saladoff actually uh, was at one time sort of one of the great public interest lawyers in Washington and uh, decided that the way that she would address some of these issues and take on the system was through social media and she came out with this movie, Hot Coffee. And uh, her energy, uh, as you'll see tomorrow and throughout this panel, has indeed been uh, quite inspiring. So before I pose the first question to Paul, uh, sort of a, a, few kind of a few anecdotes um, and thoughts. Um, you know, we're, we're in very difficult times. Uh, you know, we're, we're at the heels or in the middle of sort of a financial collapse. And there's a lot of victims. And law students and young lawyers are worrying about where they're going to find their next job. And I guess I think that the real challenge for you is not to sort of look at who's going to employ me, but how can I take what I learned in law school from professors like Zwier and Cloud and Tom Arthur and Frank Vandal and actually go out and make a change. So I sort of speak to you as the next generation uh, who really uh, has responsibility for solving these problems. And so the anecdote that I told Tom Arthur a little bit that I would say is that a number of years ago, um, a small group of people at, outside the Oak Ridge National Laboratories where they made nuclear weapons called me up and they, along with their labor union and asked me to challenge the government's plan to recycle radioactive nickel that came from the plant. And the way I thought about doing it was I would bring a National Environmental Policy Act case uh, asking for an environmental impact statement. But in order to do that, I actually had to know something about administrative law. <laughs> and the only thing I knew about administrative law is within the four corners of what Tom Arthur told me, Professor, um, my colleague here tells me I'm supposed to address it as Professor Arthur, but Professor Arthur told me a number of years ago. And the problem with this case was the government had not developed a record. There had been no environmental assessment by which to measure whether you have an environmental impact statement. And what I remembered from Professor Arthur was is that I am entitled to develop my own record. And so I asked the district court for discovery. And we took discovery and we determined that this project uh, was really not particularly well thought out. But the obstacle that we had was not whether it was a good or bad project, but whether it was barred as a matter of law mm -hmm. because there was a Superfund cleanup. And at the end of the day, um, the court actually ruled against us and said, I can't give you, I can't give you the relief you want in the form of an order requiring an environmental impact statement, but I will say this, I will say, <laughs> This is the Federal District Court Judge Kessler in Washington. She says, it is nevertheless startling and worrisome that from that early point on, there has been no opportunity at all for public scrutiny or input on a matter of such grave importance. The lack of public scrutiny is only compounded by the fact that the recycling process, which British nuclear fuel intends to use, is entirely experimental at this stage. The process has not been implemented anywhere on the scale which, which this project involves. Plaintiffs allege, and defendants have not disputed, that there is no data regarding the process's efficacy or track record with respect to safety. And the court went on and said, too bad I can't give you the relief that you wanted. <laughs> but in fact, the court really did, because a few weeks later, the Secretary of Energy, Secretary Richardson, canceled the project. So as we talk about the pleading standards and this question of whether there is a plausible case or not, I have thought over the last several weeks whether our justice system is really about finding winners and losers or is it about a process of transparency where the litigation develops a record. And if the re end result is not that which merits or meets public policy, maybe it meets re merits review by the press, by Congress, by the decision makers. So with that, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to turn it over to at least Professors Weir and the academic, my academic colleagues here to talk a little bit how the pleading standards have changed at least since Greg and I went to law school. 
All right, you have a handout, don't you, in front of you? I think you may, and you might just kind of track along a little bit here. But let me tell you that conversations about what is going on with Iqbal and Twombly really start with a case called Conley versus Gibson. And I want to give you a little nutshell on Conley versus Gibson, and then maybe you can help us try to figure out whether or not Iqbal and Twomley really did change the environment drastically in, with a new rule. So Conley versus Gibson involved 45, described in the, in the pleadings as Negro, black, members of a union who were arguing that their union, the bargaining agent for them, had not really defended their rights to be employed by a railroad. And they brought a suit and they claimed that, in fact, the union, by not vigorously fighting on their behalf to defend their jobs, and they lost their jobs and they were replaced by white employees, that, in fact, they alleged that the union was, therefore, discriminating against them and was discriminate, discriminating against them in, vi in violation of the federal law. And pretty much that was the pleading that they alleged. They said, look, we had these jobs, we lost these jobs, the union didn't defend us, they're now replaced by 45 members of white, white folks who are members of the union, um, and we're gonna allege on that basis that in fact the union was discriminating against us in the way that they were advocating on our behalf. And the court then addressed the question of whether or not, in fact, that was sufficient pleading. And in describing what the pleading standard was in the case, it says that, well, look, a complaint's gonna stand. It's not gonna be dismissed unless it appears beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts is sufficient for his claim. And the court went on there to describe a little bit about that history of, uh, you all have probably heard a bit about it in civil procedure already, the difference between notice pleading and the pleading rules that were in place in the common law for, for numbers of years, which really provided plaintiffs with traps. They had to guess, was this a trespass in, was it trespass in land, was it trespass in chattels, was it a conversion? Well, you know, remember we talked about this in torts a little trespass bit, right? In case. And trespass the question, in case. trespass in case, and depending case. upon how you would describe it, you could, you could be trapped because, in fact, you described it incorrectly, and the court would dismiss the complaint based upon pleading. And presumably in the, in the late 40s then, what the federal system adopted was a notice pleading system. A system that says that what you need to do is, we're not going to trap you by specific things that you say in the pleading, but as long as you have a clear statement, we're going to talk about that word, or a plain statement of facts that puts the other side on notice, that in fact the complaint will survive. So we can move to the discovery phase for the purposes of deciding the case on the merits. That was presumably the way that the court was supposed to look at it, that we're not going to make a procedural hurdle that will keep us from deciding the case on the merits. All right? Now, what you have then, and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Arthur, because as we were just chatting here, I, I want him to give, give and he, I'm sure he can do this much better than I can, his view of what went on in the Twombly case. Um, and, and to describe to us what it is that was wrong with the pleading in the Twombly case, can I kick it to you and then can you tell us what the court held or maybe I can come in at that point and also describe what the court held. Yeah, sure. Um, is this, you can, I think you can go is this the magic one? Okay. Um, well, Twombly is a case I've had to think about a lot because I'm an antitrust lawyer and a civil procedure teacher, so it's sort of right there in my wheelhouse. Uh, and I was a... Um, law student whose law professor, James W. Moore, uh, was sort of the, the, the Robin to uh, uh, Dean, is then Dean Charles Clark, uh, who was the chair of the first rules advisory committee, the one that wrote the rules, to sort of to his Batman, as it were. <laughs> and well, Moore made a fabulous career out of it. Um, he became uh, uh, the author of Moore's Federal Practice, which <laughs> for a long, long time until he sort of retired and Wright and Miller took its place, was the Wright and Miller of its day. 
uh, and it was sort of the, the Bible uh, for federal practice. Uh, and of course, he would regale us with stories about the framing of the rules and so forth. Uh, Dean Clark, at that time was Dean of Yale Law School, where Moore was a junior, very junior assistant professor, was the country's leading um, authority on code pleading. Uh, uh, the one thing, Paul, I would amend your statement is in between the federal rules pleading and the common law pleading with its wonderful writs of trespass and trespass on the case and all the rest of that stuff that only Bill Ferguson knew by the time I got here, uh, was a system of code pleading, where the idea was, according to the uh, uh, guy that came up with it, uh, one of the Field family, not Justice Field, but his brother, uh, was if you just sort of tell your story of the case, something which would basically, to use modern jargon, state a claim, just in sort of simple, ordinary language. Now, unfortunately, the judges got a hold of the field codes and all of a sudden started getting prissy again about whether you pled evidence because you were too specific or whether you pled conclusions because you were too general. So it sort of got to be like Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. And you had to be Baby Bear. You had to be just right. And nobody knew exactly what that was. Of course, Dean Clark had made a career on writing his Clark on Code pleading, which got to go through all that stuff. But he thought it was a bad idea. So what he tried to do was come up with what's now in Rule 8. Well, actually, the set of rule, federal rules from Rule 7 to 12. Now, uh, and what I was taught uh, was a famous case that Judge Clark had written called Diagardi, uh, in which basically a barely literate in English uh, Italian immigrant got into a dispute with the collector of the customs and read a, 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 a complaint, which I always, I used to read to my class before we did the case. Uh, and since we now use Freer's case book, I told Freer and Purdue, why don't you put the complaint in the book so people can see what you're talking about? And I still remember Professor Moore, who was a very colorful guy, uh, basically asking our class, our class of 1Ls, well, what does this case stand for? And he's the way he liked it. He liked to uh, uh, act like he was very abrupt. Actually, he was the warmest person on the law school faculty. But yeah, what does this case stand for? And we're doing our usual, blah, 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 we don't have a clue. Said, and somebody said, he goes, no! <clears throat> it means you can puke on a piece of paper, sign your name, it's a complaint in federal court. So we got the idea that, well, <laughs> pleading didn't really mean much. And, and Judge Clark had written the opinion in Diagardi, and what he'd kind of said is, well, looking at this, we can figure out what happened. You know, he's basically, if you parse it through, he says the collector of the customs at a public auction uh, sold this guy's goods, for lack of whatever, uh, to somebody else at the same price he had bid. And he also claims that a couple of cases of this stuff disappeared. So it's a pretty simple case claim of conversion, and you know exactly what he's pleading, and you also know those state claims. And he says, well, look, this guy didn't have a claim. You can find that out on summary judgment pretty quickly. Okay. Now, um, so anyway, I, I'm very thoroughly in, in the, the, the tradition about pleading was like the Conley and Gibson thing. Uh, but, and I'm, I'm leading you down the path because I'm going to turn on you now. I've come to the conclusion that the result, at least in Twomley, is correct. I'm not so sure about Iqbal. For the following reason, well, actually a couple of reasons. The main reason was is because I supervised a recent graduate of Emory Law School in his second year on his law, law journal comment. And I was rather stunned because I was used to the usual story, which is pretty much what's in the dissent. And he comes back, he says, well, you know, actually, if you look at what's in the language of the rules and the structure of the rules, things like Rule 12b-6, so that, you know, supposedly you can have a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim, it kind of suggests, along with Rule 8a and the forms, that there's supposed to be something more than just material from your gastrointestinal tract on a piece of paper. Uh, and I think there's something to that, and particularly, and it got me to thinking about Rule 11, and this is where the antitrust lawyer comes in. Rule 11 says you don't file a complaint unless you can sign it as the lawyer or the party if you're unrepresentative and assert that there's really something there. There's a real honest-to-God dispute. 
And I remember discussing this with several antitrust lawyers who also taught civil procedure. And we sort of came to the conclusion there's no way you could sign that in good faith in the Twomley case. Now, I hesitate to get into this too deeply because it means I've got to give you a lecture about microeconomics. And I really don't think this is what we're here for. But if you'll take it on faith, which I teach my students never to do, but if you'll take it on faith for this purpose, particularly after everybody's told you that they learned all they knew, blah, 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 from me, uh, and it turned out to be true, uh, it's a matter of sort of economics. Basically, the Twomley complaint said, well, look, these telephone companies could be invading each other's territories, and they haven't done it. Therefore, we say they must have colluded. And we can't tell you when they can uh, 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 conspire, but they must have colluded. So sometime in a seven-year period, they must have gotten together. How do we know that? Because they don't compete. The problem of it is uh, there's no economic basis to say. There's no reason to believe that this is actually true. And so what the Twomley complaint, the plaintiff's really saying is, I'd like to be the Justice Department. I'd like not to, to be a private attorney general in the sense that I have an honest-to-God dispute. I may win, I may lose, but I've got reason to believe, to use the language the FTC will do when it files a complaint, I have reason to believe that there's something amiss here, and now they have the evidence, so I need to be able to have discovery to make my case. Here they had no reason to believe. They might have had a suspicion, or I can't believe they're not doing this, but frankly, if you understand the economics, it's perfectly consistent with a unilateral decision. I'm going to stay out of his territory because the moment I come in, he's going to come into mine and we're both going to be worse off. Now, you might come back and say, well, you know, why can't we find out if that's true? Well, the problem is imagine the discovery requests of sometime in the seven-year period they met. We don't know when. We don't know where. We make no allegations, but somewhere. And we don't give any reason to believe, well, there must have been some place other than there's two possible explanations and anything's possible. The problem I have with Twomley is that, and maybe this is what Paul's going to get to, is that at one point they come back and say there's got to be something more than the Conley and Gibson language, because that could, that could be consistent with the complaint which says the defendant injured me negligently. I'm entitled to damages. Apply the Conley and Gibson test to that. Well, there's any number of things I can do, but it doesn't give notice. Compare that to, say, what used to be Form 9 in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And by the way, the forms are supposed to be illustrative of what we mean. And Judge Clark, that was one of his big things because Dean Clark became Judge Clark as his reward. Uh, Dean Clark had said the one state that didn't have trouble with the old pleading was Connecticut because they gave you forms. So you had an idea of what baby bear looked like. Even though the language couldn't tell you, you knew. Well, if you look at the form, the classic form is basically on such and such a day on Brattle Street in, such, in, in Boston, Massachusetts, the defendant drove his car against me while I was a pedestrian negligently and therefore caused me injury. Well, you know everything except how they were negligent, which is the one thing you don't know. But you also know that pedestrians and automobiles don't collide without any injury, and you know exactly how to focus your discovery. The discovery in the Twomley thing would be for a period of seven years. Imagine the first discovery request. List each and every time you've ever had any contact with any one of your competitors. But let now me tell me about each and every but, one of those. But let me, let me just, let me, maybe we can get, get other yeah. folks involved here too and, and, and open it up a little bit. That's the excuse we're going to hear from the court over and over again as to why we need to shut it down because the costs of discovery are going to be so great if we let it survive well, the, the pleading well, stage. Well, rule one, Paul, it, right? just but, speedy and inexpensive resolution but, but of let every me, action. Let me, let me just good. say is it very quickly, and then I'll also just do a quick system. statement of the rule for you all, and <laughs> that is that as a, as a electronic discovery lawyer, mm -hmm. frankly, that scope of that discovery scares me not at all. Let me, let me because it does seem to me that what you do is you have to identify the parties who may have been conspiring, that what you do is you do email uh, searches with those folks' names, and that you can very quickly find out whether or not they've had conversations with each other, 
over a period of time, either by email or electronically or by their calendars, and you can very quickly, and that's the promise of all this electronic discovery, and it's what the defendant did when the defendant got sued. You know, they shut down, had a litigation hold on all the communications between those folks. They've already gathered up all that information. You know that they've already done their own upfront investigation of it. They've done their drills to find out if there's anything that's going on. And, and they're set up, it seems to me, to capture that information, in part because Sorbings Oxley has required all these public companies to be able to capture that data. And my only question is, uh, is whether or not, in fact, the fears of the expense of the discovery are as great now that we have and supposedly the tools. And Ruben, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me sort of exercise, uh, uh, you know, uh, some organization over this, so to speak. Uh, this has been wonderful. But let's see if we can, I'm just a, a lawyer who actually has to go to court. So let me see if I can boil this down. Um, we had Connolly, and as I understand it, Connolly would say a, a complaint should not be dismissed for failure to state a claim unless it appears beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts in support of his claim which would entitle him to relief. Now, Twombly says, this is the parallel pricing case, the antitrust mm -hmm. case that Professor yeah. Arthur talks about. Twombly says, doesn't say we overrule it, doesn't say it's no good. He uses this weird word, it says it's retired, as I recall correctly, right? <laughs> right? Okay, it's retired. And then we get to Iqbal. And what, I, what I'd like... Can we slow down, though, just one second, Ruben, on Twombly, or before well, we get into Iqbal? Because there I, is one other thing that okay. comes in, right. and I'd like to, as, as one of the folks who occasionally represents folks who have all of the sea discovery, uh, and have, have access to all of this. I'd like to point out that there are other reasons, there are systemic reasons why Twombly makes sense if you accept Professor Arthur's reading of it. And here, here are a couple of them. Think about the case where somebody goes flying in on this seven year period and flailing around and doesn't find something and manages to go ahead and establish that there was no conspiracy when somebody else later on could have come in, could have done it, could have done it right, could have fired a rifle shot. You have, you have that systemic issue. The second systemic issue you have is that you have cases being filed where there's a hope that there's something. And those cases are in the courts. That's and they're ahead of the cases where one of Ruben's clients really was injured. So those are, Paul, just but two of the me, quick let me, systemic let me, things. Before we get sure. into the debate about this, what I want to do is sort of lay out the test. That is, if you are a practicing attorney, what sure. is it that you have to put on a piece of paper to have your complaint sustained? Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah, we, and so yeah. we, 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 get, we get to Twombly, which is a decision by Judge Souter, and some of us who read it, maybe Jeff can chime in here, thought mm -hmm. that this is, uh, was written for an antitrust case that would be very complicated and cost the parties a lot of money. And then we get to Iqbal, yeah. right? And uh, as I read, Iqbal is a situation where uh, a Muslim or a number of Muslims were de detained subsequent to 9-11 and there was a suit against the Attorney General and the court came down with, and if I miss the standard, I have my professors who can correct yeah. me, which is basically you strip out all of what you what are what the court deems to be the conclusions, but who the heck knows what a conclusion is? Mm -hmm. You look only at the facts, and then you determine whether you have a plausible case. And so that is the case. That is, that, as I understand it, is what we are left with today. Okay. So, if you are pleading a case, you are pleading a civil rights case, Cheryl, right? Um, what kind of problems? How do you determine what's a conclusion and what's a fact? Or Chris? You can't. <laughs> I mean, often you can't. And, it, but, you know, I practice plaintiff's employment law. I don't, where Iqbal and Twombly have been used against us is to make the cases more expensive, to try and mm. beat us into submission. But that's what Rule 56 is, too, you know? I mean, <laughs> we don't file these cases the way that we used to because we can't win them. But the one thing I will say about Iqbal and Twombly, and at least in my experience with Iqbal and Twombly, is that the judges always let you amend once. 
Yeah. And that's how you save your case. Um, and when we're suing public employers, we can do Open Records Act requests ahead of time. So we get all of this early discovery. So our complaint should have more facts that show that we have claims. So I think the threat of Iqbal and Twombly in employment cases is somewhat overblown except as to expense. Except as to expense. Because we're contingency fee lawyers. So right. all of this is my time that I'm spending ahead of the gate and maybe will never get paid on. Okay. Well, let me, let, me ask, let me ask Chris whether he, whether he agrees, because I know, I don't recall that you do defense work. Yeah, no, um, you know, Iqbal and Twombly affect every case that we file. Um, we're in multi-district litigation relating to municipal bond derivative price fixing, and there are 30 international banks involved, and our state agency that we represent has involvement with 20 of them. Uh, we decide, well, these other 30 have been named as complaints in a global conspiracy, and do we add them or do we not? And we didn't add them precisely because of Twombly and Iqbal. Um, I got another case that, that um, involves um, corporations, and you got a parent company, you got a holding company, and then you got an operations company. And I'm wondering, you know, I don't know who's making the decision here. I've got lower level employees. Am I going to get kicked on Iqbal or Twombly because I named the parent company uh, or the intermediary company? One thing, though, that she just uh, pointed out is, you know, they changed the federal rules. Um, now, when somebody files a motion to dismiss, you've got a right uh, to amend, a right within 20 days. And so that makes us feel a lot better. Um, where are they going to fight us? Where are they going to attack our, our complaint? But it is. Um, it is a serious question and a serious issue that you always have to address. Um, and it's something that we really struggle with. I haven't been burned on it yet, but this is where I'm most concerned, is the standards aren't that clear. And judges have a lot of leeway. And so yeah, if on true. my second, if, if they file a Twombly Iqbal motion on me and then I amend, um, I haven't taken discovery, I may not know my answer yet. And if I get a judge who's aggressive, um, my case may be gone with prejudice. And the, the non-clear standards, that's what scares me. Because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of judges have biases. Sometimes those biases favor me. Sometimes those biases don't. And that just ups the ante on who that judge is. So you know, Jeff, you're doing high impact litigation. These questions of fact, conclusion, plausibility. <coughs> Um, what does that mean to you, and, and how, how has Iqbal Twombly changed your practice? You and I, I guess, grew up in a period where it was Conley Gibson and DeGarty Durning, as Professor Arthur was talking about. Right. Um, and, and do you want this? Yeah, would you like Sure. And we elderly people resist change. You know, we, we like it the way we learned it, and, you know. But, but I will say this. Uh, when you read these cases, Iqbal and Twombly, keep in mind that Twombly is written by former Justice Souter, who establishes plausibility, a plausibility standard based upon the economics that Tom talked about. And then you get to Iqbal, and all of a sudden, a majority of the court lets loose this genie throughout all civil practice, which results in the uncertainty that Chris talked about. I'd submit to you this, that the, the problem with the Twombly-Iqbal standard is exactly what, what Chris pointed out. A, a, a system that is based on the rule of law works a lot better if competent lawyers can read the cases and predict what is likely to happen. The problem with this standard is it depends on the judge you draw <laughs> because, you know, my idea of plausibility and Tom's idea of plausibility and Susan's idea of plausibility plausibility I mean you know come on it's uh, so I mean I, I think it's a it is a it puts a lot of power in the hands of trial judges who already have plenty <laughs> uh, and uh, I th and, and I think it, it is in the early years of it anyway I mean it'll be around you know after I retire I suspect um, that uh, it, it's moved in the direction of uh, kicking cases uh, yeah, you might get one bite, but often that's not enough if you don't have access to the data that's in the hands of the defendant. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think what, it, what the effect of it, we're talking about access to justice, we're talking about access to the courts, is there is less access than there was before this standard grew up. Can, yes. can I actually, I, I want to talk about, a little bit about the elephant in the room here, which is these judges and who, who, who puts them on the bench and what their biases are and why we're not getting fair trials and why we're not getting fair decisions. Um, because, I mean, there should be no reason why, even under these standards, that if someone brings a case and then they learn through discovery some additional information, why they shouldn't be able to go back and amend the complaint, add additional defendants, do whatever it is, if we're talking about justice here, if we're talking about, you know, people getting a fair shake. But that doesn't happen right now because of the biases that these judges have who are being put on the bench. And, uh, and so I just want to just make sure that that is out there because this is not like we're in a vacuum here. It's not like we're talking about, you know, like a fair level playing field. We're just not. Well, I haven't heard from you, Professor Morgan. I haven't been invited. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard from you. You're, can I tell you, you're, you're always CJ. invited. <laughs> So uh, before, just before the, uh, we started, uh, Ruben uh, leaned over and said, now, now you're going to be provocative, right? And so, <laughs> so let me be provocative. What the hell? It's late. We're all tired. There's no booze. So There will be. Not yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> from my point of view, there are two villains to this discussion. And I'm, I'm setting aside the judges in general for Susan because that's a whole other topic. But there are two villains. One of them is, unfortunately, the reality of life. Uh, the other one's easier to get mad at, though, and it's this the, the guy who in the 1930s was the dean of what used to be a great law school in New Haven, um, <laughs> uh, Dean Clark. He's the villain of this story. Now, it's not because, you know, he did... He was incompetent or stupid. He was faced with exactly the problem that Tom and others have hinted at. After centuries of first this you know, writ pleading, God bless us all, and um, I think like I said, God bless us everyone, I guess is where writ pleading comes from. Uh, and then code pleading, which comes out of New York State in the mid-19th century, the 1840s, from the Field Brothers, uh, we get this just nightmare of pleading practice, where in the old wit practice, the idea was you argue on paper, literally on paper, whatever the, the, the allegations are to begin with, until you narrow it down to one issue, and then we'll have a trial. I mean, this is insanity. I mean, you don't have to have, have experienced it to recognize it. I'll read you one sentence from The Great Bleak House by Charles Dickens, uh, referring to after describing the Court of Chancery, Dickens writes, uh, suffer any wrong that can be done you rather than come here. And that, that's the pleading <laughs> practice of the 19th and early 20th century. So I'm extremely sympathetic to, uh, to Dean and then Judge Clark's desire to get rid of that mess, because that's the mess he knew. It's just that he created a worse mess. And here's how he did it. Notice pleading and promiscuous discovery. Rule 8 doesn't just exist in the context of Rules 11 and 12, it exists in the context of Rules 28 to 37. What a disaster. Yeah, but, but that kind of, yeah, that's, I'm talking about this, you know, the 56 and 65. I'm talking about right now just the discovery rules. At the time that these rules were adopted in 1938, there was not one jurisdiction, not one, state or federal or local, that had the full panoply of discovery that went into effect in 1938. There wasn't one. Michigan had a bunch. No other state had more than just, oh, you can do some written requests for documents, or you can ask questions of one person at one time, maybe. No state, and the federal government, even more than the states, just didn't have any significant forms of pretrial discovery. Judge Clark's innovation, along with a professor from the University of Michigan, who uh, was uh, also a, a partner in this crime, said, look, we'll just make it easy to file the case. We'll get rid of all this pleading practice, just notice pleading, and then, well, we'll have discovery. And people will find out so they can find out what the claims are. And it all sounds plausible. 
After the rules were circulated and were about to go into effect, Judge Clark and various people on the committees, and I'm sure Professor Moore was on some of these trips, they traveled around the country to every big city where they would meet in a room full of hundreds of confused, disturbed, and often angry lawyers <laughs> saying, what are you doing to us? And there would be, and, and there, there would be hours of these meetings, whether it be 400, 800, New York it was 800 people, in Dallas it was 400 people. And at every meeting, I, I'm, you know, I am perhaps the only person you will ever know who has so little regard for how he spends his life that I've actually read the minutes of all of these meetings. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, and at every one of these meetings, at least one lawyer, at least one lawyer would get up and say, uh, uh, Dean Clark, here's what I think is going to happen, though. All these lawsuits are going to be filed, and, and then, uh, uh, you know, Lawyers are going to do this discovery thing. They're just going to jerk each other around for years. It's going to cost a fortune. It's going to be a hassle. It's going to be abusive. It's and Dean Clark would then pontificate, no, no, son, that's not a problem because the federal judges won't let that happen. <laughs> well, you know, you know, he was soon to be, you know, anybody who practiced law in the 70s and 80s and 90s after this system had finally matured recognizes what a joke that was because once the system matured, uh, fe federal and state judges had very little management of the discovery process and for good reason. It was slow, confusing, awful, you know, lawyers were at their worst. Uh, in the, I think the Twombly, it's either in Twombly or Iqbal, uh, uh, the opinion, the judge who writes the opinion cites at length from a, 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 an, a, an article by Judge Easterbrook who talks about why judges can't, just aren't capable of controlling discovery. And that's just was the attitude of federal judges. Leave me alone. This is awful. You guys are mean to each other and it's rude and you're infantile. I don't want any part of it. So what, what we end up with is a system that's every bit as bad as that 19th century suffer any wrong that can be done you thing that England and the U.S. faced. Can I give it, you No, a, no, I'm, I'm going to finish. Let me well, finish. But, no, let me let finish. Me, let me, uh, Paul, let me, Paul, I'm on a roll. Let me finish. In 19... <laughs> so, <laughs> so what... No, well, let me... It's okay. Twombly, Twombly... Getting to this century. Yeah, but this, no, this, is, this is important stuff now because we're getting to, to Conley. Everybody here is talking about Conley, and I had to say that stuff to be able to make this point. That's why I'm fighting for it. Twombly was... Uh, uh, Conley was decided in 1957. That was 19 years after the rules went into effect and about 15 or 20 years before the full discovery mechanisms were really rampaging and ruining litigation in this country. There was still relatively little of this discovery abuse in 1957. So it was easy for a judge in 1957 to say, okay, like Judge Clark said in 1938, this is the way we go. What's happened is, as we all know, since 1957, there was years and years of bad practice that we all as lawyers, I in one, get to take lots of blame for. So the 1985 decisions beginning the process of allowing uh, summary judgments actually to be granted in federal cases, followed by Iqbal and Twombly, I think are on the law not only rational responses to an abusive, incoherent, broken system, I think they are right on the law. That doesn't answer whether they're right on the politics, the policy, and justice. But on the law, they are, I think, absolutely correct. I agree with Tom on that. And, and I think, uh, Morgan, my view is, is that you've joined the Chamber of Commerce in your brief on behalf uh, to the Supreme Court that we've heard over and over again about this nightmare of the discovery mm -hmm. and the discovery abuses that are out there. And you know, my friend, that judges have actually managed discovery, and they manage it under Rule 26F. They have, they have a conference <laughs> that they require early. They manage it if they're doing their job, and I will name you uh, chief judges all over this country that take this absolutely seriously. They say, we want a discovery plan. We're going to hold you to it. Rocket dockets have been instituted. And what we have is we have this impression that we have this huge, expensive discovery mess. But in fact, the courts have been very active in managing. 
and that counsel sees it in everybody's interest, including their client's interest, because they're not going to stand for it anymore to move it along. Yes. And that my, my view is, is that, in fact, that overstates the mess that we're in. And it makes for me a view that I'm troubled by, which is that Iqbal and Twombly assume a, a, a nightmare that's out there, that's unmanageable, and then, then are suspicious of plaintiff's motives as to whether they're on, on fishing expeditions. And my view is that if you look at the federal statutes that you have to, you have to what do you have to claim? Fraud, discrimination. Right? You have to you look at what, what uh, we've listed here, which is what, what, where you get into federal court, what you have to do. You've got to prove that somebody was discriminating. You've got to prove that somebody's purpose was to defraud, to deceive, to trade on inside information. And if what you're going to do is you're going to say that somehow there isn't going to be a discovery aspect to that, to try to get at circumstantial evidence about what somebody knew and when they knew it, and you're going to try to make that determination without discovery, in my mind, that changes the battlefield. Actually, uh, the word plausible, the court tells us is not probable, but it treats it like plausible when it comes to securities fraud. Uh, it treats it like it, and it shuts the plaintiff out, in my view. When, 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 Paul and I had this conversation first in 1996. And so, so uh, since 1996, you're exactly right. Judges have cracked down on discovery right. so, abuse in ways that we couldn't even anticipate so. then. God bless them. And also, they've done Rule 65 and Rule 56 and Rule 12 and Rule 8 changes. I, I, I think it's all part of a peaceful one. I think it's all yeah. good. And you know, I'm the, I'm the one that turned around to the rocket docket in the Eastern right. District. I do, want to, I do want to say, though, it's really important that we distinguish between what the rules say, and by the way, they don't include the word plausible, um, and, and how they ought to be interpreted in a rational way, and then what judges are actually doing. And I want to make the distinction between what the rules ought to be as they're interpreted, and then how cases actually are played well, out. I don't think it's Twombly's fault that judges are politicized. Let me, let me, let me, let me sort of cut it here and, and try to isolate some of these issues. And what I'd like the panel to do is probably uh, you respond in a minute or two to each of the questions so we can get, get some more dialogue. But I heard one elephant in the room, which is you've got this standard that is entirely subjective and it's being put in the hands of justices who at least, or judges who at least some people would believe are not acting reasonably or have bias. And I've heard another elephant in the room, which is, is that we have changed the pleading standard because we have a discovery problem. And I sort of heard a little bit from Greg about that. Okay. So what I want to pose to each of you is, in 30 seconds or less, and I know that's hard for people to do, especially if they're lawyers, um, is, is it reasonable to bar a complaint entirely because you may have a discovery problem down the road? Or do you look at what the dissent in Iqbal and Twombly said and said, if you have a discovery problem, let's think about managing those problems? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, let me, let me start uh, let me start with Greg and, and then go to Jeff, because I haven't heard from you two in a while. Sure. Let me put it this way. If the complaint is that Greg Hanthorne is a bad human being, because Reuben Gutman knows that Greg Hanthorne is a bad human being, and now I am being asked to go pull out my bank statements, to go bring people forward, because there might be some set of facts somewhere that shows that Greg Hanthorne is a bad human being, as opposed to what ought to happen, which is people ought to take judicial notice of that, but, but putting that aside, it's somewhat like the law of gravity. That presents a problem for me, Reuben, and, and I think that's what Twombly attempts to get at. We're going to argue about where the lines are drawn. We're going to argue about how to apply plausibility, but you ought to come in with something and you ought to come in with something that I can, so that I can understand what's going on. If intent matters, if those subjective things matter, you ought to point out some fact that gives rise to a reasonable inference that it's there. Okay, and so I think that's, that's a fair reading of Twombly. Well, well from my, my plaintiff colleagues, you know, uh, you know Jeff, Chris, uh, Cheryl, um, you've got a complaint that a judge may have some concerns about, and he's concerned that this is going to cause the parties, or the defendant at least, to expend a lot of money on discovery. 
Is there a way to manage discovery? Is there a standard, for example, form court order or that, the, that, that could be issued with regard to managing discovery? And I seem to recall that Professor Miller had articulated some thoughts in this area. And I don't know if you, any of you want to take a crack at that. But Jeff, for example, maybe you could do that. Well, what I will say is this. The, in the state court system over the last uh, generation, uh, it's gone from a very non-interventionist situation where judges didn't manage cases, didn't manage discovery, to in many courts now, a situation where the judge calls you in after the case is pled and says, okay, how much time do you, do you think you need? How much time do you think you need? Cuts the baby in half somewhere. Um, and, and, and really, to, and says your trial date is X and I'm not moving it. And, and that tends to produce more orderly development of, of a case. I'd, I'd just raise this one question. In a dispute between a plaintiff and a defendant, can you say as a generality that one side prefers the case to come to trial sooner than the other? Yeah. Plaintiff, because they only get paid if they win. Well, there, there may be some cases where defendants think they have a, right. you know, slam dunk defense too. But in general, the plaintiff has got to prove stuff that happened in the past. And the longer it goes, the harder that gets. Um, and so it does seem to me that, uh, you know, the, the notion that discovery has run amok, I mean, is we can certainly all point to examples of that having, uh, having occurred, despite the best efforts of judges and maybe even the lawyers. But uh, as a general rule, defendants do need access to information in order to develop their case and try to prove it, but uh, it, they, they don't have a vested interest in letting it go as long as jar dies. How do you deal with this, this concern that Greg has? He's, he represents a large corporation, he represents uh, AT&T, and uh, your firm has sued them, and uh, you're asking for a ton of discovery, every single document that they have, and uh, you know, how do you deal with the, the, the issue of discovery abuse? Well, is it a real issue? Yeah, it, it's an issue, but it's one that the rules allow the judges to manage, in my opinion. Um, and I, it's happened to me. I mean, a, a, a good judge is, is, going to, is going to hold both sides to the fire to move things along. If five years ago you said, Chris, you're a plaintiff's attorney, um, you, I'm going to ram Twombly and Iqbal down your throat but I'm gonna give you a promise that every motion to compel that you file will be decided in 30 days. <laughs> I would have taken Take that deal in a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because a trial date that's one year out doesn't mean much if you can't get a judge to hear and rule on your motion to compel. Amen. Um, because we're looking for the truth, okay? And a defendant who is in the wrong and we'll assume that sometimes they're in the wrong, sometimes they're not. But a defendant that is in the wrongs, his attorney's job is going to be to ethically obscure the truth within the rules. And your job is going to be to make him reveal it. And many times you've got to compel it. And that's my biggest problem. And I want federal courts using more magistrates. When I'm in a, a federal court system that uses magistrates to take discovery issues, I think you get better justice. I think you, things go quicker. Mm -hmm. Courts, judges, don't want to deal with discovery disputes. They get tired of lawyers fighting each other. Magistrates are a little more hungry from what I've seen. <laughs> you know, in yeah. New York, you get a magistrate and you're there. In Florida and state court, you get a hearing in five days. You know, And Georgia's a little different. Georgia doesn't use magistrates in the Northern District. So. That's my thing. I want motions to compel to be heard. I want protective orders to be heard. You know, I, I, I do a, a, a notice to inspect something, and they file a motion for protective order that, so I can't inspect it. I can't get it heard for four months. Well, how do I get my case ready to trial? And I've got somebody who's sick, and that person may die, and it's hard to prove damages for a dead client. So those, those are my thoughts. So, you know, there's uh, this expedited... Uh, a pre-trial practice in the most famous places in the Eastern District of Virginia, Rocket yeah. Docket. Yeah. Have you practiced in those kinds of jurisdictions? Yeah. It, now, the, the standard, the, kind of the standard camp is traditionally that, well, plaintiffs like that kind of jurisdiction because they have their case all ready to go before they file. Defendants who are corporations don't like it. Is that your experience? Is that, it doesn't sound like that's your experience at all. You're, you're kind of describing the opposite. No, I, I mean, I love being in the Rocket Docket because I meet deadlines. Now, you got a lot of plaintiffs, guys out there who want to, 
you want to get extensions and stuff. But the rocket dock, it scares the heck out of me. I mean, I'm terrified up there, and I've got a case up there. But I will not miss a deadline. I will not get an extension. And I know also that they will rule on my motion to compel in weeks, not 30 days. Uh, and they'll let the other side have it. And, and because they know that, defendants are much more cooperative. And I'm not saying defendants are all bad. And, you know, I'm just saying that in my, when I'm searching for the truth, the defendants usually got more stuff to discover than the plaintiff does. Okay, that's just because of the, 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 the there's just less information between the two parties. Um, and the plaintiff has less information. So the rocket docket gets me the information much quicker. But it does scare the, scares me to death. <laughs> you know, Cheryl, Cheryl, you're president of the Georgia chapter of the National Employment Lawyers Association. You and your members represent people who are workers who have been retaliated against because of what they've done on the job, uh, reported problems with their employer, uh, race discrimination, gender discrimination. Um, are you guys the ones who are causing all these discovery problems? Is this an issue for you? <laughs> Not particularly. Um, I don't know that we have a lot of discovery disputes, except oh. to the extent that, I mean, yes, companies try to hide documents and won't give them to you unless you force them to, but, you know, one of my colleagues uses extensive discovery, but only because she gets her cases settled before summary judgment. I mean, if we go to summary judgment, we lose, right? So we need to get the information because if it's there, the case will settle. Well, you know, now that you said that, I want to circle back to Professor Arthur, Professor Zweer, and Professor Cloud. And the question I want to pose to you is, is you know, here's Charles Laguerre, and she's representing individuals. And it would appear to me that the kind of discovery she's going to be requesting is not going to overly burden a corporation. Not that a ton, right? You know, and, I mean, and, and if Iqbal and Twombly cases have more than a couple of banker's boxes. Okay, and if Iqbal and Twombly are really about dealing with discovery issues, do you think maybe? that Twombly and Iqbal should be really kept to the larger cases? In other words, are they, are they just only, ca only, only uh, rules that should be applied, rules of law or, or interpretation that should be applied to the larger cases as opposed to Cheryl's cases? Let me pick up on Greg's hypo. I think a complaint that just says, Greg Hanthorne's a bad guy, and his badness has injured me and I need to recover, shouldn't have a minute's worth of discovery. I, mean, I think at some point, I think there has to be something beside, you know, there has to be some genuine dispute that you ought to be able to say, if you really think he's hurt you, you ought to be able to say something other than he's a bad guy and it hurts me. Now, part of the problem with the old code pleading was you had this question about how specific to be. Nothing in Twombly or Iqbal has said you can't be too specific. All it said is at some point you got to say something to suggest that you really have a claim. Okay, well, rule A, not just, you know, Conley and Gibson was also judge-made law. It's not the rule. It's not the rule that's promulgated. Rule 8 is the rule that's promulgated, and it says that you have a plain statement which shows that you're entitled to relief. So right. some kind of showing is in the words of the rule. Well, let's say I'm walking across the street, and Professor Zweer drives his car and hits me, right? Yeah. And I say, I, well, I walked a pool. <laughs> Okay, I walk across the street, Professor Zweer was negligent because he ran me over. Is that a conclusion or is that a fact? Well, for that, as I already mentioned, the forms are by definition what the rules require. Okay. There's a rule that actually says that. I mean, if you wrote something that was exact, you know, which fell right along that form, it states a claim. Let, let me ask you, Ruben. So, in securities litigation, I say, <laughs> You traded on inside information to my damage, to my injury. And I say that the price of the stock fell. Is that going to be sufficient under Iqbal and Twombly? Well, well I, you know, Greg Hanthorne saying no, so I'll take his word for it. I, I, and, and, and my colleague is agreeing with you right. to your immediate well, Yeah. Yeah. No, right. it's not even close. And, and, and this, this to me is, is, is the question when you have to strip out what are deemed to be the conclusions and then apply the plausibility standard only to the facts, you need some guidance as to what a conclusion is, right? And so I say, you know, they trade, they, they, you know, they engaged in insider trading, they engaged in wrongful conduct, they engaged in fraudulent activity. I mean, isn't, Professor Zweer, 
those similar to the types of sort of conclusory, conclusory allegations we saw in the Iqbal case. You know, in Iqbal, right, what you had is you had a you Pakistani Muslim who was saying, I was in detention for a long period of time. Now he's suing Ashcroft and Mueller, Ashcroft, the Attorney General of the United States, and he's saying this was orchestrated, it was a pattern and practice to arrest Pakistani Muslims after 9-11 and put them in a safe place and hold them for a long period of time, even though there was no, and the description is no reason that is connected to either the safety of the community or pen penology, right? <laughs> I think no penological reason for his confinement. That's what he alleged. Why isn't that sufficient? Why isn't that sufficient? For him, he pleads it. He says that was going on. I'm going to I'm going to find out your discrimination intent about a group of people that kept me there. And maybe you say, well, at a beginning there was safety concerns, but after some period of time it stopped being a safety concern. And I'm saying I was in I was incarcerated for this period of time, and you all just didn't care. You were rounding up. Pakistani Muslims, and it's based upon a discrimination against Pakistani Muslims. Why isn't that a sufficient plea? And, how, and, and if I can just follow up yeah. with that, is that how can someone in that kind of position have more information to be able to plead more? What if it really is true what he's saying? How would you ever know without pleading it and getting discovery? It's like, it's, it's, the, it's the chicken and the egg. I, before we move on to another topic, you know, one thing that strikes me, we're in, we're in this financial crisis, and there were a lot of financial products that were sold that we're only now beginning to understand, okay? And, um, you know, Professor Arthur, particularly in this environment, um, shouldn't, we be, shouldn't we be opening ourselves up to transparency more than ever? Shouldn't we be saying, yes, now is the time to expose corporations uh, to discovery? And maybe, maybe, Jeff, you have some thoughts on that. I, I think that's Professor Arthur's question. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you've got to ask a question basically what litigation is about and what it's for. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, the reason why the public subsidizes these things is because resolving disputes peacefully as opposed to, as our forefathers did, with you know, battle axes and blood feuds and since I'm part Scottish with uh, the Campbells versus the McDonald's and Darks. all the rest of that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, oh, we kicked your ass. Uh, <laughs> is in part is to, is to resolve disputes, you know, and I keep hearing all these different things that litigation is supposed to do other than what it, I think it's supposed to do, which is supposed to, you know, resolve a pre-existing dispute. Now, when you come back and say, well, this person wants to have an investigation of the Attorney General because he's pissed and he thinks that, well, maybe, you know, I'll get lucky and find out that's the reason why I had trouble without any real reason to know that it is. Um, I'm not so sure that just well, because this would, you know, this would be like a great FOIA or this would replace what the New York Times does. I'm not sure that's really the purpose of litigation. Well, I, I, I guess I want to pose it this way. If you all recall the Ledbetter decision, the Supreme Court ruled that Lily Ledbetter did not have a case because her statute of limitations had run. Mm -hmm. She lost the case. The dispute was resolved against her. And yet the transparency of the Supreme Court's decision actually prompted a congressional response, which was to change the law. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I, I guess what I, what I want to pose is, is, is obviously one purpose of litigation is to resolve disputes between parties. But in our system, and maybe, Susan, you have some thoughts on this, at least. Uh, isn't another purpose to create a record so the public and Congress, we have three branches of government, can say, you know what, is this the right result? Do we want to change the dynamics? Do we want to change the law? Are you asking me? Or? I just want to do some yeah. Ask Morgan. I want to go back to this point that Susan made a while ago, because it's the kind of, uh, I think it's maybe it's one of the, another, I don't know how many elephants we can fit in this room. <laughs> if, you know, Paul brought up what Iqbal pleaded, and if you actually, I would encourage you all, I could read you for minutes and minutes and minutes about it from, from, the, from even the Supreme Court opinion. If you just go look at the Supreme Court opinion, it's 129 Supreme Court, 1937, 
and read what he alleges in his complaint was done to him and who did it and why it was done. It, it is incomprehensible to me that this doesn't state a claim upon which relief can be granted against the named defendants under the Twombly standard, including the mysterious plausibility requirement. Mm -hmm. So that said, I think this brings us to the point that, it was, that Susan tried to raise a while ago. And, I, and I've, uh, Paul and Ruben have heard me say this in, in other contexts of kind of similar conversations this year. I just think we have to talk about who's a judge, why they're judges, how they got to be judges, and what if people in the democracy are not happy about this, I don't think that the language of Twombly is the problem. I think it's how it's being interpreted mm -hmm. by individuals who have lifetime appointments. And I think that, that now we're at the politics. It's, I know it's, you know, it's uh, September 2011, so I guess we're hot and heavy into the election. And I just think that's what this really ends up being about. And I think sub rosa, that's kind of the theme. Anytime we talk about access to the court, fairness to the court, how are the courts behaving? And so I hope that at some point in this last hour we will least consider talking about this less technical, more troubling, and more volatile subject. Because I think it's the people and how they interpret the language, not the language, for example, of Twombly itself. I think Twombly's the language is right. Right. And so and so who benefits from these from these cases? Who benefits? It's it's well, all by, of us apparently. Yeah. But by and large it's the huge corporations who are who are not going to be able to be held accountable, who are not going to be who, who are not going to be uh, 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 served with this, with this, these discoveries. So they don't have to disclose their information. They don't. They can continue to hide their stuff away and make more money and not be held accountable. And that's essentially, you know, who benefits because you and I don't benefit. You know, n none of none of the people in this room will benefit from this. Um, and and we really need to think about that as a society. Why are we electing judges? You know, why are judges being appointed to political basis? But. You know, let me throw one further elephant in, though, and, and it has to do you with Iqbal. Elephant, he at me. Yes, because you, you threw the last elephant in, and it's, it's very simple. Iqbal itself. I wish I could lift no, an elephant. Iqbal itself may be a simple example of the fact that the Supreme Court always has an incredibly difficult time with cases involving wars and cases involving a presumed attacks on the United States. That's the box that one probably fits into as a personal opinion and nothing other than a personal opinion that may be my generation's Korematsu um, and that's that's what we're talking about here now to go back to Twombly and to, so I I happen to Professor Cloud have the same reaction reading it maybe my one difference is I wondered whether a, uh, a complaint was stated against the named defendants as opposed to others but we can argue that at some later date. Can I ask the professors a question? I'm just curious what you would say about this. Why doesn't Rule 11 take care of the problem that, that's being created? If there's really no case, if there's really nothing there, why isn't Rule 11 just the, 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 the could have been used to say, this is a frivolous case, so you shouldn't go forward? Why do we need to have another standard? Well, if the standard is, no possible set of facts can be adduced in, say, the next seven years to state one. The only way you can ultimately win your Rule 11 motion, when both the law was vague and the standards are vague, is when you actually win the case. And the case will settle long, long, long before that. Now, I'm just talking about the Twomley case. Twomley is, you know, I think Cal was sui generis because I could say, I mean, an economist could say, look, you really have, you, know, you basically have said nothing that, other than something's possible. That's a far cry from a lot of other cases. Mm -hmm. The real failing in the Twomley case to me is, in Twomley and Iqbal, is that the court takes one thing away, but it never brings anything back and tells you what it is they're looking for. I mean, I don't have any, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to join the chorus of criticism of plausibility. I don't know what the hell that means. I really don't. Uh, and I think they're very, very fuzzy, and I think the district judges have run with it because here's a way to get dispositions. And they, you know, since, you know, no administration anymore can get anybody confirmed, whether he's a Republican or a Democrat, we don't have the judges. The judges feel like, my God, between that and the zillions and zillions and zillions of cases from the wretched war on drugs, they don't have time to do the job. I think that's a lot of what's going on. 
do you like Tom this uh, I guess Adam Steinman suggests that it that it should be a requirement under Rule 12 of a plain statement of facts, as opposed to that it plain. that we get to this this uh, notion of plausibility. He suggests that that language does matter, and that that the problem with plausibility is we're away from precedent and we're out of the moorings of, as uh, Professor Cloud says, of what the rules say. Yeah. And that what we ought to get back to is a requirement of a plain statement of facts. You still have the problem of what's the difference between a fact and a conclusion and an mm. opinion. Yeah. But perhaps the word plain gives us some way of saying what we're looking for in the way of, uh, of, of facts, a more mm. factual statement that might be a compromise. Well, I think it's better than plausible. Mm -hmm. but, but I used to be a real lawyer, but I haven't been one since 1982, so I'd really like to know what the real lawyers think about. How would that work? And would that give more predictability, you know or would it still be as mushy? It's a question you don't know what to say, or you don't have anything to say. <laughs> no, I don't mean I'm not trying to say that in a nasty way, but is it that sort of like, I know what to say, I just don't have it, and therefore I need to investigate before I really could file the case? Or is it that it's really unclear because the, the pleading and, you know, abuses of the writ system and of the code system was you had the information, but you never could figure out what the hell you're supposed to say. You see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, that's a that's Or are those two statement. separate issues? Yeah, yeah, one's a trap and the other one is do you know, can you allege uh, facts? Do you have the information that you need? To plausibly make a claim. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't, I'm not that... That's not a real big issue for me when I file cases. I think I do have the facts. Uh, unless you're alleging yeah. a price fixing, but you don't know when the meeting happened or when the agreement Well, or happened, you don't or even know. Allocation, but it's worse than that. Know. You don't even know that it happened. Yeah, yeah. That's that, right. I mean, seriously, that's, yeah, the, that's my problem. Yeah, you've so you say, well, they must have agreed. And, and that's, a, that's a big problem. That has to be That's a non sequitur. Yeah. Um, you need something more. Yeah, and, and that's what Twombly dealt with. And, I can and they didn't that. have it. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. but. Um, my big thing is, is when I give enough, is a, is a judge going to just yeah. really, yeah. really push it out there? And, and I've heard cases recently, even a federal court case, Jeff, you probably know this, about misrepresentations weren't uh, alleged specifically enough. I think it was a Northern District case recently. And you're just like, whoa, yeah. that was pretty clear. And so you're just yeah. all over. I'm going to exercise my prerogative and, and try to get through the other two subjects, which, which dovetail into this. And, uh, the first one that I want to start off with is, is class actions. And uh, this year, the Supreme Court came down with the Walmart case, the Dukes case. And uh, uh, um, obviously, that uh, reversed a Ninth Circuit decision certifying the class. And for those who do class actions, at least in the employment context. Can you all hear OK? For those, for those who do class actions, at least in the employment context, that was a, a bit of a concern. And some say at least one nail in the coffin of class actions for the, the civil rights bar. Um, I, I guess for those in the audience who are students, um, how important is the concept of a class action in terms of redressing the rights of, of low paid workers and consumers whose grievances may involve thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred dollars? Maybe Jeff and Jeff and Chris and uh, Cheryl, you guys can address this. Well, we haven't done class actions in the Eleventh Circuit in a long time, anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. um, what you know, difference? You mean the Eleventh Circuit or you? Anybody? No, yes. In, yeah, <laughs> plaintiffs, employment lawyers in the Eleventh, practicing in the Eleventh yeah. Circuit. The EEOC brings class actions, but they don't bring that much litigation around here, anyway. And, um, and my apologies, and that's because we made some really bad law in the Southern Company case and some others. Um, I don't think, I mean, th there is <clears throat> uh, a predisposition against dealing with employment cases uh, on the part of federal judges with the rough justice that class actions bring. Cause, because, I mean, the truth is that when, you, when you're dealing with a class, uh, some people, you know, if, if you're successful and you can resolve <coughs> a class action, some people will not maybe get all they should get. Other people will get more than they are entitled to get, but the point of a class action is that it dispenses efficient justice, and it gets to the bottom line and, and moves cases along. Um, and, I, and I think there's just a, a predisposition on the part of uh, uh, 
of judges in the Eleventh Circuit, uh, they've, they've really empowered judges and, of course, in a lot of individual cases, magistrates to make these, you know, really credibility decisions based on uh, summary judgment kind of evidence, uh, which is a perversion of Rule 56. Well, well, let's, let's break it down. There was a point in time where if you read Newberger, who's the authority on class actions, he would say that uh, an appropriate use of class actions would be civil rights or employment cases. And that was probably somewhat before you and I went to law school or about the time we went to law school. And that changed at some point in time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of the cases we were talking about then were also injunctive relief cases Correct. as opposed to right. money cases. And, Absolutely. you know, if, if you're going to bring an employment case uh, and, uh, you know, you, you're, you're looking for money, I mean, you can you talk can about... Cases. Yeah, well, I mean, th those just don't work in the Eleventh Circuit anymore. I mean, just, they just, they won't fly in a number of other circuits as well. Okay, well, in, in, the, in the Duke's case, the Walmart case, they, the Ninth Circuit certified it as a B2 class, right, with right. the incidental relief being the money, and the court said you could not do that. The incidental relief of the incident. pay yeah. for right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but uh, I, want to, I want to sort of... I want plausibility, to sort of, I think, plausibility, but I want to, But I want, to, I want to focus on, the, on, on sort of a practical question. Yeah. The practical question being that you, you were counsel in one of the largest race discrimination employment class action cases in U.S. history, right? Okay. Why couldn't I'll, you I'll bring... i accept that fact. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll stipulate it. If potential clients are watching. You certainly will accept that fact. <laughs> So, and, and did a terrific job, got a terrific result, right? Thank you. Um, but I recall you brought that as a class action. Right. And why could you have not brought that on behalf of numerous individuals as opposed to seeking class relief? Well, because there, there was certainly efficiency uh, to, uh, because there was a, you know, the employer admitted, uh, cent you know, centralized decision making about how uh, decisions were made and about how uh, pay and promotion and so forth opportunities were, were dealt with. Uh, I, I think the, the difficulty with the Walmart case is obviously there's a, this fight about whether the locus of decision making was in whatever that town is in Arkansas <laughs> or whether it was at each, each store site and all over the country. And, um, you know, whether, whether the courts you know, expressed concern about that was, you know, I mean, I, I think they were sincere, <laughs> at least right. in saying, we, it, it looks to us like, you know, you really can't prove centralized decision making, and therefore it's, uh, you know, it's, it's unmanageable to do it other than maybe store by store. Okay. Well, you've given us sort of the lay of the land and what's happening with regard to class actions as applied to Title VII cases. What I want to ask Chris is, I, 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 I stated a hypothesis that I thought okay. that class actions would move forward or mostly moving forward in securities and antitrust cases. You do consumer cases. Um, what's going on with regard to the individual person, the individual who has uh, a grievance, like he bought a tire and the tire blew out, and there's a thousand of those people, because the t and, the, and the allegation is the tire was defective. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, I think the wage and hour cases survive Walmart Dukes, right. yep. and, mm -hmm. and we've got a... Uh, and I think those are, are important cases to, to protect people. Um, just so, say a word to the first year students yeah. about what, what, what wage Yeah, a wage in our case is just where um, it's um, protecting employees on minimum wage and overtime requirements. Um, you know, it, the example is, um, you know, your employer making you get to work 30 minutes early, but um, not paying you for that time, um, or, um, making you work weekends and not paying you. But, you know, and you've got a family. You know, I'll throw the plaintiff's <laughs> angle in it. You've got a family and kids and, you know, it's hard. And, and you need to be paid. The law says you gotta be paid if you gotta be there 30 minutes early. So, um, and, and Cheryl and I were just talking about that. I mean, that law's good. And we both do right. some of that work. And I don't think that's gonna, going to change. Yeah. Um, but those are opt-in cases. They're opt-in cases, they're right. Opt right, and they're not, they're not certified under, under Rule 23, right? right. They're, right. They're, in fact, the Rule 23 doesn't apply to those type, types of cases, right? right? Um, so those are a little bit different. Right. And so let me ask you to focus on uh, you know, just a regular consumer case where the consumer purchased a product that was uh, uniformly defective across the board. I mean, do, do you see those types of cases going forward? Well, you know, I mean, we can talk about Concepcion, which is, you know, that's the big, one, right. especially when you start talking about legislative response, that'll be interesting. 
Um, but a consumer product case isn't really affected, I don't think, that much by Concepcion. Um, I will tell you this, as far as consumer product cases, go ask a bunch of product liability lawyers who did rollovers in the late 90s, early 2000s, how many rollover cases they had. I don't know if everybody saw, you know, in the last maybe 10 years ago, cars were rolling over, the new SUVs, and they were rolling over all the tread separation cases, people dying from rollovers or tread separation. Well, those cases aren't there anymore because they're building safer cars, you know? And the reason is because if they don't, people are going to die and they're going to get sued and they're going to pay a ton of money. Um, and that's where the consumer protection and product liability class action is important. And I, I think those are still good cases. I mean, I, I haven't seen anything from the Supreme Court that's really heard about that. Well, well now that you brought up Concepcion, let's, let's talk a little bit about Concepcion. So who wants to, who wants to open up and discuss what that was all can about? I, can I actually bring on a sure. little bit of that? Because it sort of follows from my movie. So yeah. um, I don't know how, how many of you have seen Hot Coffee yet, but... If not, I'm going to do a little plug tomorrow, 4 o'clock. Yeah, don't miss it. Um, but so I don't think there are going to be many of these consumer class action cases that will exist after Concepcion because, um, because if you don't know, um, in every contract that you're being asked to sign now, there are going to be these bans on both your ability to bring cases into the court through mandatory arbitration clauses, and there are going to be bans on these uh, on on class actions. So every every single contract, and you're signing them all now, you know, online to buy anything, you know, your credit card, your cell phone, your mortgage contract, your 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 gym membership, your your even when you go to a hospital now, you're going to be signing consent form, and they're going to have these bans on it. So th these are going to be eliminated completely by Concepcion, and I do not understand how we can live in a society where corporations can make millions of dollars off 30 or 40 dollars of each of us and we have no say in it. Okay, so for all those who don't know, tell us a little bit about what happened in Concepcion. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, 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 maybe somebody else can go through the details of the $30 with AT&T. I don't know all the, although I know I've been screwed by it. I know that I, I actually paid that $30 when I got my new cell phone recently. But essentially, Concepcion says that um, corporations can legally put bans in contracts. So if they put a, they can put in your contract that says you have no right to ever bring a class action. And so why should we care? I mean, you all know, do, do you all, I mean, I don't know how, what year you all are. We've made a lot of assumptions here that you all know what everybody's talking about. And I don't think you do probably because I think a lot of it was, you know, um, but um, and that wasn't mean to be down on you. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> I mean, they're talking over a lot of people's heads. But, um, but you know, class actions are, are so that, you know, when there's a $30 claim, you know, who's going to bring a $30 claim, right? But when 2 million people have a $30 claim, then you know we should be able to bring those because why should it be fair that the company makes you know all that money and we and, and we get screwed? So now Concepcion's basically said that those are all legal, and as well as mandatory arbitration clauses in contracts, which you'll see what that's all about in hot coffee. Okay, so let's talk about two things. We, the, you have somebody who has a contract with AT and T, and AT and T says that we'll give you the service for free, but they send them a thirty dollar bill for tax or something like that. And the person gets a lawyer and says, well, it must be that everybody is owed $30 and I'm happy to do this case because I can bring it as a class action and it'll be profitable for me because there'll be millions of dollars in recovery. And AT&T says, no, you signed an arbitration clause. And by the way, that arbitration clause says you cannot do class action arbitration. And, and by the way, they didn't sign it. They just couldn't activate their phone if they didn't agree to it. You know, okay. they didn't actually sign anything. Okay, so, so Concepcion gets into, into two, two areas, right? So One is, accept. I'm sorry? Accept. You click accept and then download. <laughs> yeah. okay. Is there anybody in America who's ever read one of those? Right. Well, I, I had a student long. who told me he did. <laughs> yeah. I suggested he get a wife. Well, I, I, yeah. You were paid, you were paid. Well, <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, I actually read oh, it. You actually me. read it? Yeah. Well, I, I have to say the real reason we brought Chris, Chris I told Chris that if he came here, uh, Professor Arthur, he may find clients, so. <laughs> Um, um, so there's two issues. One is sort of the corporations taking contractual action, or theoretically contractual action, to bar, our, bar uh, class actions. And the other is this question of compulsory arbitration, right? So, you know, you've, you've raised this, the, 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 I guess, uh, in the context of Concepcion, the discussion or the importance of class actions. So uh, maybe again, Susan, because you've thought about this greatly, what are the important, how, how do you see class actions as being important to the, to the you know, uh, the poor person who, you know, has a 40 or 50 or $100 claim, which may not be a lot to the company, but is a lot to that person? Right, so, I mean, 
I don't know, maybe I just think it's so obvious that, you know, no one's going to be able to bring, I mean, when you get screwed on your, on your, Okay, this is the example I give when I do my Q&As all the time, because I'm doing Q&As after the, they, people watch the film, and, you know, their general audiences, they're not law students. So I have to explain what's a class action, you know, how, how does it affect you? And I usually give this example of, so your credit card bill is due on the 30th of the month, and you pay it on the 30th of the month, and it gets there on the 30th of the month, but internally, within the company, it's as if the credit card, if your ch check doesn't come by noon on the 30th, you're going to get pay, charged a penalty and interest, right? So you got a $35 penalty and, I don't know, 10 bucks of interest or however much your, your interest. And you go, wait a second, my bill got there on the 30th of the month. Why should I be charged this? And y you're students. What, 45, 50 bucks a, a month? That's going to make a difference to you. It will to my daughter, you know? And she, th that might be, you know, an, an extra night out or something and whatever anyway and so it's 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 not just aggravating but you know it, it costs people money but who has the ability or the resources to bring a claim to do anything really for that amount of money because the filing fee is going to cost that even if you went to small claims court it's going to cost you more so it really doesn't make ec any economic sense or most of these people who do this don't have the ability necessarily even know how to do it. So it doesn't make any economic sense to do it unless there's a class action where you can all be bundled together and bring it as one claim. And that's what a class action does. And that's why they're important. Well, Professor Clouds hinted to me that he's ready to be provocative. <laughs> yeah, and, and not only that, but completely incoherent. So that's, uh, I'm a, I have uh, two very, it seems to be contradictory responses to this. The first is, following up what Tom Arthur said, when, when you see that little circle we have to click with, with your mouse, say accept on this language that no one has ever read. Every time I do that, because I went to law school back at a time when things like rights were at least still talked about, there was a phrase called contracts of adhesion. And yes. I don't understand how this is in, enforceable against anybody, and, and to me it's just a mystery how this could be enforceable. It seems so ludicrous. On the other hand, I have been, again, <laughs> uh, I, apparently my consumer choices are about as good as the way I spend my time reading boring <laughs> shit. I have been a member of more consumer class actions than you can imagine. I get these goddamn notices all the time. And so far, you know, about the third one where I got the right to get $75 off the next time I bought Barbary books. I said that, you know, I don't even read these things anymore. You know, I've been, I must have been in a hundred class actions and I've never gotten a dime. But I know lawyer, you know, and so this is, this is where Paul's going to make me now actually join the Chamber of Commerce because as a consumer and consumer class actions of the sort you're talking about, it's very hard for me, even though I'm sympathetic a hundred percent with the, the position you're, you're laying out, you know, as a consumer, I've never gotten any benefit, ever. And so, I, you know, I get the right to buy some shitty, you know, 1980s Ford car I don't want to buy and get $50 off. Oh, boy. You know, but, but I know that the lawyers who bring the class action and maybe the, the name, the, the class plaintiff are getting money. So I think this has been a problem for consumer class actions for a long time that even people like me who are wildly sympathetic to the notion have this kind of irritating, wait a minute response. And so I think that's something that people on our side of this never talk about, is how do you make these consumer class actions actually help the plaintiff class? But as a good torts lawyer, I would say to you, you have benefit. <laughs> You've benefited because over and over again, for example, the hidden fees and credit cards that you're charged, where credit card uh, causes of action have been brought, the, the conduct has been disciplined been dropped out and so the benefit is that the society as a whole then learns from it and uh, the fraud is named and and presumably we're better off and the question will be whether or not we now do learn about the fraud yeah. that's going on or whether or not in fact it, it continues or ever learn of those that's what I started to get it. it's like if there's a success that actually benefits all of us because the insurance companies stopped doing this or whatever if we don't ever learn that really happened it's as if that, what, what Tom talked about at the beginning, the transparency of litigation, which is, to me, the great thing about public litigation as opposed to private dispute resolution, there's a public solution. Um, and if we don't ever find out about it, because it's a, a settlement that's sealed, or it just doesn't get covered in the paper, or whatever it is, then that benefit I never experience. 
I mean, that I know of. I may experience it in my checkbook, but I, I, don't, I don't know I'm getting it. Well, you've, you've opened up a door to the question I have about arbitration, and there's sort of two attacks on arbitration. Some people say it's not fair. But putting that aside, um, what about this question of transparency as applied to arbitration? You have, for example, uh, you know, brokers and dealers who sign uniform securities registration forms, and if, in fact, they're discriminated against on the basis of gender by a large uh, corporate entity, um, they're compelled to arbitrate their claims, and there won't necessarily be a public record. Do you guys see that as a problem? I think it's a terrible problem. It's, I've, you know, Paul has laughed at me for years at my kind of anti-diluvian, uh, uh, that's before the flood, uh, of the resistance of alternative dispute resolution, because I think public courts where you have judges and lawyers and witnesses and maybe sometimes juries and the newspapers and TV people and the, now the internet folks to be there to cover it. To me, this is justice. When people get behind closed doors and, dis and solve disputes that affect us all because they involve businesses and business transactions and how banks do business or how uh, your client, you know, the Southern Company does business and we never know about it. I think that is a, a, a failure of democracy and I'm a gimmick. I agree with the failure of democracy point, but one of the things that democracy did was pass the Federal Arbitration Act that set the statutory framework that allows this to happen. And it is, in fact, the law that is being enforced in these instances when we're talking about arbitration. I am also just stunned with the irony of hearing, and, and maybe this is where I read too much stuff, hearing about how litigation is too expensive and my god now they're going to force us to arbitrate when arbitration was designed as pushed as understood as a way to avoid that expense now there are absolutely problems with arbitration there are there were arbitrators who were not serving people there were there were systemic problems with claims getting heard that nonsense needs to stop that doesn't make sense. But to simply say that this doesn't sit right with me, therefore this statute that got passed needs to go away because it doesn't sit right with me. Therefore we need to do what I consider fair because it doesn't sit right with me. I, I, have, a, I have a hard time with that argument. Before I open it up to the, to the floor, let me pose a question to the, to the uh, professors here. Uh, Greg talked about the Federal Arbitration Act, and I guess in around 1990, the Supreme Court came down with the Gilmer decision imposing uh, that uh, arbitration requirement on, uh, on agreements, employment agreements. Um, do you believe that the Federal Arbitration Act was really about commercial disputes, right? Or really, uh, is, or is it appropriate to extend it to employment, employment agreements or, or, or issues where public, public uh, policy concerns uh, are being addressed? He said the professors. I'm, I'm looking yeah. at you. Well, I, you know, I, I, I confess I'm not an expert. <laughs> well, what, what, what I want to know is, is there, you know, for example, labor unions have arbitration agreements and they work pretty well. And if you talk to yeah, union lawyers, they say that uh, it's an appropriate and reasonable way to address grievances. Is that a negotiated term by lawyers representing both sides as they enter into the collective bargaining? That's exactly right. Right. So I think we need to. I think we need to make a little distinction between forced mandatory arbitration and voluntary arbitration after a dispute occurs. They're very different. And, you know, I just want to, in, in hot coffee, we deal with this issue of forced mandatory arbitration, which is essentially where before you ever know that you're ever going to have a dispute, you're signing a contract, you never know you're ever going to have a dispute with this company, and you sign away your rights, and then you do have a dispute. And then the company that you now have the dispute with, they pick the decision maker, they pay for the decision maker, the decision maker doesn't have to give a reason why he or she comes up with the decision. There's no right to appeal and it's completely secretive. All right, now, who do you think wins? Now, a voluntary arbitration, on the other hand, is after a dispute occurs, both sides decide, well, it might be cheaper or it might be whatever to go into this system of arbitration. We both get to pick neutral arbitrators, maybe we each pick one and then the two of them pick a third. So there's a, the neutral arbitrator, we pick who's gonna, ha we're paying equally for it. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. 
it's this forced mandatory arbitration that's the problem that I see, and, and particularly in consumer cases. Well, sure. but I, so my organization's position, Neela's position, is against forced mandatory arbitration, but I have to tell you, because of the other elephant in the room with the judges, I personally have very mixed feelings about this, because most of the arbitrators around here would split the baby so my client would get something. At least they wouldn't get kicked out on summary judgment. Um, so I really do have mixed, and, and the other thing is for my, particularly in my gender cases where we're talking about women who are lawyers, for example, who I represent, or women who are bankers or professionals, if they file a lawsuit in federal court, they will never get another job again. Mm -hmm. They will have to plan to work for themselves. So arbitration might be a better forum for them. So I have very, I think. And you're saying that they won't agree to it after, you're saying the other side won't agree to oh, it afterwards. No reasonable corporation, I did defense work for, half my career was defense and half as plaintiffs. No reasonable corporation is gonna agree to arbitrate an individual plaintiff case in the 11th, you know, in the Northern District of Georgia or the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, why would they? Their chances are so much better in federal court. So it's, it's really, and so I have to, but you know, with the caveat, Neela is against forced mandatory arbitration. I personally, as a plaintiff's attorney in the Northern District of Georgia, mm -hmm. have very mixed feelings mm -hmm. on this issue. In oh. employment cases. In employment cases, yeah. correct. It, you know, one thing also that Susan pointed out about they pick the arbitrator, the power to pick is a huge power because if you're a large corporation and you're picking arbitrators over and over and over, if you're a professional arbitrator, who do you want to be happy right. at the end of the arbitration? You want the company that hires arbitrators. You don't want Chris Hall, the individual, who hires an arbitrator or is involved in an arbitration once in his life. So the power to pick is a huge issue. And then another thing about the class actions that, you know, um, I believe Pre Professor Arthur talked about, about litigation being a way to resolve disputes peacefully. I believe that litigation is also a way to level playing field and a way to make society safer. And that is a philosophical difference that I have with a lot of people and a lot of people who are on the Supreme Court. But when you hear that your insurance company or MasterCard is overcharging you a buck fifty a month, you say to yourself, because you live in America, no, they're not. They couldn't get away with it. There's no way they could get away with that. Well, the reason they can't get away with that is because someone's going to sue them, okay? And they're going to get—they're going to have to pay 30 cents on the dollar <laughs> of what they overcharge. And that's why I brought up the thing about the rollovers and how cars are safer. And we also talked about class actions because there's a societal benefit for having advocates, and it makes things safer for you. There's just one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Just one one specific thing on picking arbitrators. Chris Hall, plaintiff may only be in front of an arbitrator once in his career. Yeah. Chris Hall, plaintiff's lawyer, yeah. Cheryl Lagar, plaintiff's lawyer, mm -hmm. Greg Hanthorne representing, so it isn't as uneven. Uh, in those cases where a lawyer is involved, you really do see that splitting the baby happening more, and they're not just trying to uh, trying to please the defendant lawyer. Or if they are, they do a really lousy job. <laughs> You're, not <as> happy. <laughs> You're not as happy as you could be. experience representing companies, do individual consumers show up with lawyers? They aren't in a class action, just me and my dollar fifty a month or whatever it is. Do they, do they show up with lawyers? Honestly, Morgan, I, I don't have an experiential base to, to answer that because I don't see I, nobody, you, you would be insane to hire me to go do an individual arbitration over a buck fifty, and as Tom points out. <laughs> but I wanted to point out there's one, and then you generalize, and you still no, no, get to no, the but same. I mean, just almost any kind of case for an individual. If you only want to talk, the biggest seems to be barrier to justice is unless there's some kind of contingent fee pot of money. It's very difficult for ordinary people to have their disputes in court. I mean, there's a huge ADR movement, which is not just what we're talking about, but mm -hmm. because who can go? Now, it's interesting if, you, if you're an American history buff like I am. <laughs> there was a time when, you know, an ordinary person could have John Adams as his lawyer. Right. Abraham Lincoln as a lawyer. I mean, seriously, people mm -hmm. like that. 
Now, on the other hand, they didn't have all this discovery. They didn't have all this other stuff that costs a lot of money. But, you know, Judge Davis and his retinue of lawyers could roll into Galesburg or wherever it was in central Illinois, and, you know, you could hire Mr. Lincoln. You could tell him about his dispute this afternoon, and tomorrow you're in court. And they all litigated in public. Uh, now, litigation's expensive. Ordinary people can't do it. I was just unless, you know, unless they, you know, go to, you know, they're in a position to go to court looking like the mummy. And, you know, and, all, and everybody goes, oh, my God, you know, like yeah. the Simpsons episode. And, the, and there's zillions of dollars to be had. But if it's just a matter of ordinary disputes, not a dollar and a half, even, you know, $10,000, you know, you can't really afford it. So I, I would think like, that's a huge problem. So I would like to say to you all, <laughs> one of the really interesting things about your world, mm -hmm. where when you get out, is to think about whether you want to be a country lawyer mm -hmm. or a, a person that will take those cases because what you're going to do is maybe you won't make a gazillion dollars but you'll represent somebody and you'll bring your skills to see if you can make a difference on behalf of somebody and what we see all around is folks that are now because of this economy not going with big firms but are opening up their doors there ain't a whole lot of money in it but there is I would say Abe Lincoln like satisfaction doing things on behalf of individual people and doing it in a way that makes a difference. And guess what? Many of those folks really grow practices that also do very, very well because you get known in your community, you get to be kind of the glue in the community. And I just encourage you all that sometimes I think we say, well, you can never bring a lawsuit unless you're gonna make a gazillion dollars. Your, your business plan is, unless there's 50 million in, at stake, we don't bring it, all right? Or maybe not. Maybe you listen to somebody who comes into your office and you say, yeah, let's give this a try. It sounds like you've gotten, you've gotten taken. Uh, and all I'll say to you is, is that I, I think there's great satisfaction in that kind of practice of law, enormous satisfaction. The, uh, the first case I ever was involved in, I was representing a labor union, it made me think of it because Greg Hanthorne was on the other side. And, there but for the Emory Trial Techniques program, I would not have known what to do in court. And the point is, is that this school offers an immense opportunity for the second year students to really learn how to um, bring a case from start to finish. And if you can do that, when you, if you can go to court and appear before the judge, the judge is not gonna ask you whether you were a law journal or where you graduated in your class, and your client looks at you as a lawyer and doesn't ask those questions and you can bring a result for somebody who really needs that kind of help. And in this day and age, there may not be a lot of job offers for lawyers from big firms, but there are a lot of opportunities for lawyers because there's a need for lawyers, and if these people don't get the representation, they're gonna go unrepresented. And so I, I, that, that is sort of my comment, and that's what I take away from at least the trial program and, and you know, this today. Um, we have time Ruben, for- can I take two seconds yes. to just amen that? Because yes. it, it works at both sides of the practice. The reason that I was allowed uh, to go into court against Reuben Gutman flying down from D.C. to represent uh, the SEIU uh, against my poor little client. <laughs> John Portman. <laughs> yeah, who happened to <laughs> But uh, was, was because of, of what happened here at Trial Techniques. So it, it isn't just the you know, that, that once you do that, that's a program only if you're going to go ahead and, and go out and, and hang out your shingle or do any particular type of law. Uh, it, it was phenomenally valuable to me and continues to be phenomenally valuable to me uh, in, in a career inside of a fairly large law firm. You know, the way that Abe Lincoln made a living, even after he was successful, was he and the other small group of lawyers and the circuit judge would literally ride horses from town to town. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they'd get to like the tavern in right. some crappy little town in rural Illinois, which basically is a redundancy. <laughs> <laughs> Three redundancies. I, I spend a lot of time in Illinois. Uh, One and, afternoon. And like, the lawyers, like they would share a room, they'd share a bed, and, and the, the historical evidence is that it was you know, for sleeping only. But, you know, <laughs> they, they did not live lavishly. Uh, and I think one of the things that we, in this era of, you know, we've had a half a century of unprecedented wealth in this country, it's very hard for us to think about 
what it takes to scrape by, start a business, start in the beginning. But I will tell you, if you have a laptop and an internet connection and a printer, and you better have a suit too, I guess. You know, there are, you know, the possibilities now of replicating that 19th century mm -hmm. circuit writing are really remarkable. And talk about great levelers. This technology uh, allows us to do stuff that we couldn't have imagined six years ago, let alone 20 years ago. So I really want to just stress with, that you will leave this law school with some capacity, certainly greater than when I left law school I had, to do things on your own. Um, but you know, the likelihood is you're going to, if not sharing a bed with you know some six foot four weird looking guy from Illinois, um, you know, you're going to have to be willing, if you don't go work for some firm like Ray's, to, to be bold and gutsy and, and do it on the cheap. And you can now, that's what's yeah. great, you can. Yeah, but can I just say something about that? I think that if you do, just call other people and find mentors. Because what you don't want to do is get into bad habits when you start on your own. You don't know what you're doing, and you just like sort of go out there. There, I'm not from or I mean from uh, Georgia. I live in Oregon, but you know when I started out, and and now as uh, when I was practicing, I would answer the phone call for young lawyers all the time. I mean, really take advantage of your alums and other people and ask questions. Questions of you or anybody on the panel, Professor Vandal. Uh, I invite you in particular. What, what, what's your take on it? Well, I was struck by the discussion of the compulsory uh, arbitration and, and Greg's statement that uh, there's legislation on it. And uh, one issue I try to raise in my book is that um, uh, because of the power of the corporations and the lobbyists, that uh, the corporations draft uh, that uh, mm -hmm. legislation, and it's in their interest. I think it's a mistake to start twisting the substantive law because you want to reach a particular result. I mean, I am not one of these people that sort of says, oh, well, this case is explained because, and I went to Yale Law School, which is the <coughs> legal realist law right. school. You know, well, Judge, you know, Judge Smith didn't like Judge Jones, and therefore he saw a chance to do X, Y, Z. It seems to me you've got to play them straight. Uh, if the law is, you know that he's got doesn't have a claim, then the you know the result ought to be on the merits. He doesn't have a claim, but I don't. You know, if the law is, on the other hand, if there are facts you could plead, then it seems to me they ought to be able to specify what they are. And either you, could, you know, it's like I was going with, with Chris. You know, either you can say them or you can't say them. And I would think in most cases, if they had some clarity to what they were talking about, folks could say them. If they can't say them, I have to confess I'm not sympathetic. Where you say, well, look. I don't know him, but maybe if you'll just let me ruffle through his files, I'll find something. That's a bit unusual, and I gotta say, I don't think it's done anywhere else in the world. Representing some international clients, it is not done anywhere else in the world, and that is always a fascinating phone first phone conversation when the first document request comes in 
uh, and you're explaining what is about to happen to someone in Sweden, to someone in Germany, Nobody to someone in Japan. This. Which is oh, interesting. We sort of assume oh, you can't now, now you got me going with that. I mean, let me let me give you one kind of counterexample out there sure. in the international world, which which I ran mm -hmm. is in a criminal context. Okay. But when you're talking about the International Criminal Court and you're talking about whether or not somebody has committed a high crime mm -hmm. and misdemeanor, like for example genocide, what the International Court recognizes is the fact that if, as a superior, you didn't punish somebody after mm -hmm. you found out about it then you must have committed genocide. The rest of the world has, takes evidence of what your intent is, including intent to defraud or insider trading or um, whether or not, in fact, you are engaged in antitrust violations or whether you conspired to do it. And I just say that the international uh, world sometimes takes evidence after the fact. As and in criminal intent, proceedings, based correct. Based upon the way that folks react to it. And I, you know, I guess I'd say to you, I, I think that what you're talking about often is these intent issues. And we, we have horrible times with intent issues because we know that intent is, in some ways, it's a fiction. It's something that's made up after the fact. Well, but intent it's, has it's never dual, been part of it's Conley. Dual, it's no. it's multifaceted, and in some ways, Nobody even knows why they did what they did at a particular time. But Paul intent. And so that's the that's the fiction that we're dealing with in, in the pleading context. But intent was never part of Conley. That's 9B. That's one of the things that the rules themselves in the United States of America say must be pled with particularity. That has nothing to do with what we've talked about in terms of Twom Twombly well, and some I of these and other I things today. I disagree because I see cases that use Iqbal and Twombly to interpret 9B. And they argue that it's not plausible that you have the wrong intent. This is where, to me, I state that you have the wrong intent and you discriminate. And then they say, but it's not plausible that you can prove that. Well, they shouldn't have to do that. They should say that if all you did was state that you discriminate because I know you discriminate, then you fail under 9B. You don't need Twombly. If what they say is, you discriminate because here is what happened with everybody else with the same background, the same experience, the same requirements, therefore I infer intent. That works under Twombly, that works under 9B, that works. You would think. Yeah, I would. Well, you would, you think. would think. I would. Except You're right. as, as the way that it's, that it's yeah. applied. The only thing other, other question. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the most sophisticated thing anybody said tonight. So. <laughs> well, he's just dissed us all now. Yeah. He said it was yeah, the most sophisticated thing. No, that, that wasn't a diss. It was, there, there was still plenty of room. I mean, <laughs> all right. Well, I'll give you the last word. Yeah. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. Uh, I think that it's one of those times where I feel one of the first times in the eight years I've been at Emory that I've, we've had a chance to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I've really appreciated the opportunity to talk to my colleagues and also to talk to members of the bar who are all struggling to figure out whether we've got the right balance mm -hmm. in our access to our courts. And it's been great to talk with you as an audience. And Let me, and we'll see you, see you tomorrow. This, this center that Paul runs, the Center for Advocacy, uh, is a great, great center. And I hope you'll keep your eyes open for other programs they put on and look to get involved and support it because it's a really great undertaking, not only with these programs here, but the programs all around the world that they're doing to mm -hmm. uh, raise the rule of law issues. I think they've given up on doing it here in the United States, so they've moved on <laughs> to <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> Well, I, I just want to thank, I want to thank uh, Professor uh, Zwier, Professor Arthur, and uh, Professor Cloud, and just sort of note that as an alumnus, uh, and I say this, I guess, on behalf of myself and Greg, that once we graduated from here, um, we've, we've uh, gravitated back to the law school as part of a greater community, and being able to participate and listen to them uh, makes me realize how much I still need to learn about the law, and uh, that this law school offers a continuing opportunity, not only for students, but for alumni to do so. So I appreciate that. And I'd like to add, particularly <laughs> by one else that I see in the audience, to think that, my God, I'll never figure this out, and what am I gonna do? <laughs> you know, it's great for professors to see their students. Right. And of course, you gotta get to be old like I am before you start seeing a lot of it, but it's great to see them there as established lawyers in their own right. Uh, doing as well as, as Ruben has been doing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a neat thing, and you can do it too. And you will. Amen. You bet. Amen. You will. Yeah. Good night, all. Thank